Taylor. I'm also from the CRC 806 in Cologne. And I'll be presenting my master's thesis on reconstructed land use with GIS. Land use um, is pretty much the conceptual tool that we use when we want to combine data from multiple sites into original analysis. We usually do this by reconstructing mobility, settlement pattern, procurement pattern, and other elements that we like to combine into the common term land use. Um, but I think any of us that has experience with doing this knows that this can be pretty complex. And especially when we're trying to compare data sets that were obtained with different methods or um, analyzed with different methods with each other. So therefore my goal here during this project was to get behind the concept of land use in Paleolithic archaeology and to tackle the issue of comparability of land use reconstructions. I aim to develop a method with which archaeologists can reconstruct land use reproducibly for all different kinds of data sets. I'm going to start here with a very short definition of land use the way I use it. Um, basically it can be described as the relationship or the interaction between people and exploiting the environment and their environment. And this includes many elements that are familiar to a lot of archaeologists, um, like how often a group moves camp, where they move camp, and where they procure or how they procure the resources. An example of this is, um, or a well-known example, is the forager collector model that was presented by Lewis Binford in the 1980s. And he could show that land use is tied to mobility, especially when we're dealing with mobile hunter-gatherer societies. And this is exactly where the GIS analyses come in. Because the remains of a Paleolithic group's lifeway is not represented in one site, but scattered throughout the whole landscape, we need methods to actually combine this to paint a real detailed picture of the group's culture. And starting from this, I defined the goals for my project. The one was to define the concept of land use, and then to develop a workflow with which we can reproducibly reconstruct land use. I tested this workflow on an archaeological data set, and doing this, I evaluated the applicability of GIS analyses for land use reconstructions. And today, I'm presenting the first comparable data set for individual land use reconstructions. So the first step was to tackle the concept of land use itself. And as I already said, the relationship is really complex and comprised of a bunch of different elements that you can see all here. I extracted all these elements from Benfordian and Alpine foraging theories and tried to put them together. And because they have a generally hierarchical nature, I could sort them into this hierarchical model. And this shows us which element of land use interacts with which other one and how. For example, how um, for example, how what people actually do in their site in their base camp results in this isn't working either. Um, results in what the archaeologists can find when we excavate the site. And this is only the basis of the model, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly, and we can talk about it later if there are more questions in more detail. So um, the model starts up at the top with the three inputs in blue, group composition, environment, and technology. And this basically translates to which people are living in which environment and which tools do they have or which technologies do they have at their disposal. And these three inputs determine the cost of procuring a resource, and that done for all resources available determines the selection of resources that the group can actually use, or that it does use. And this resource selection determines, um, along with the attributes of the resources actually selected, determines four groups of other land use elements. So in green, what happens in a site? In orange, how people procure their resources. In yellow, where they go in the landscape, and in red, how they cope with resource insecurities. In this project, I'm not going to re reconstruct everything, but I'm going to focus on population distribution, settlement pattern, and mobility. And starting with the first one, with population distribution, you can see the model from the analytical perspective. This is less the theoretical hierarchy of how land use works, but more what we can actually do with it. Um, this shows specific steps that we can undertake when trying to reconstruct land use and how reliable the results from each of these steps are. Basically, each land use current station has three steps, analysis, inference, and prediction in the gray diagram. First, the direct analysis of the population distribution. That means we have to analyze the site distribution. For example, we can do this with point pattern statistics or other methods. And once we've characterized the site distribution, we can go on 
and from this infer certain other properties. For example, the resource distribution. And from here, if we have the data available, we can go even further and predict the procurement strategy. For this population distribution, we're going to be keeping it simple and only really talking about the site distribution, because for every other element here, we need additional data that wasn't available in this phase of the project. So we have pretty much the same thing for the analysis of the sediment orientation and the analysis of mobility. They're both based on cost distance modeling, which is something that all of us know pretty well. I'm using the method that was presented by our CRC colleagues last year in 2017 in this wonderful paper. To do, to start with analyzing the mobility, which are the first four boxes in the inference part of the gray diagram, I model so-called procurement ranges or site catchments, they're analogous, um, around each site. And I do this by using the resources that are found in each assemblage and link them back to specific spaces in the landscape. I can compare these catchment areas and then describe a, groups, a group as more or less mobile in procurement related activities. And I, with this, I can also see where they're actually traveling in the landscape. We can also use the site catchment analysis to examine the resources that were available in the vicinity of each site. And this is what I call economic potential here in the bottom branch of this diagram. Um, with this, we can see if site locations are oriented towards specific resources and can analyze spatial and temporal differences in the settlement structure, the settlement system. For example, we can see if certain sites have access to a few critical resources and if other sites have access to single or no resources at all. And that tells us about the system that the groups were actually living in. Okay, that was the method. And before I'm presenting the results, I have a few words on the data sources. Um, yeah, our CRC 806 was working with the German Archaeological Institute and the Institute of Archaeology and Cultural Heritage Sciences of Morocco for the last 20 years, surveying and excavating uh, a small region in northeastern Morocco. And these projects that started in 1995 and finished in 2015, they culminated in the discovery of over 350 archaeological sites, of which 54 could be excavated. They're all represented here in this nice map. This data set was good to test the method because um, of the high quality raw material data that came with most of these excavations and these surveys. And in addition to this, the proximity to the Strait of Gibraltar makes this region interesting when we're trying to study cultural differences and similarities between North Africa and Southwestern Europe. The sites on this map, they date to all known phases of Northeast Moroccan prehistory from the Paleolithic into the Islamic times. And today I'm going to be focusing on the Stone Ages, the ones in bold, the Middle Paleolithic, the Upper Paleolithic Iber Marusian, and the Epipaleolithic. And this way, you can trace land use changes from the Pleistocene into the Holocene. So, I'm going to start by presenting the results of the site distribution analyses, and then I'm going to go into the site catchment analyses. This was the first step uh, analyze the site distribution with Ripley's K function and kernel density estimation. The K function here at the bottom shows me the site pattern, and how the sites are actually structured, and how they pattern together, and the kernel density estimation shows you where the sites in these clusters are in the landscape. So for the first time frame, for the middle Paleolithic, we can say that the sites are located in all three regions of the study area. There's a very prominent, pretty clear cl cluster on the coast, uh, but the settlement of the interior, when it gets a little farther inland, is more, um, more homogeneous. In the Ibra Marusian, uh, there are very few sites, and they're located mostly in the inland. They're also farther away from each other than the inland sites were in the Middle Paleolithic. And finally, in the Epipaleolithic, the groups dispersed from this one settlement region in the interior and uh, settled three distinct areas um, with very strong clustering. Now, after the site pattern, now the site catchment analyses. This first one tells me about the settlement orientation in relation to resources, what I called economic potential in the last few slides and allows me to predict um, the spectrum of procurement-related activities that were undertaken in the site. So to do this, I modeled ranges around each site defined by four hours walking time. <coughs> this is my estimation of the area which a person can travel, procure resources, and return back before nightfall. But then I color-coded each range according to the resources that were available. The green ranges have access to both lithic and freshwater resources, which are the ones that I used here for this analysis. The yellow and the blue ranges have access to one of these resources, and the red have access to neither of these resources. Again, in the middle of the Olympic, the sites on the coast where the large cluster was, 
have access to both living and freshwater resources, while this is more variable in the interior. <coughs> so here we can predict that at least the activity spectrum could be at least different between the coast and the inland, and maybe even more variable in the inland. In the Ibermerusian, all the sites have similar eco uh, economic potentials, have similar resource accessibility, but interestingly, they're not settled directly at the resources like they were in the mid Paleolithic, but always a good distance away. So you had to travel up to or a little more than four hours to actually get your lithics or your water. This changes in the Epipaleolithic once they split up into the three regions. They settle directly at the resources and aren't traveling very far at all. It's still a little farther away in the inland, but not quite as in the preceding phase. Good. The second site catchment analysis visualizes the procurement related mobility using the resources from the site's assemblages. Here I took lithic raw materials because um, they're fairly easy to trace back to distinct sources in the landscape, at least for this region. Um, there are six main lithic materials that were used in this area, throughout this, and they're available from primary and secondary sources throughout the whole study area. So first I looked in the assemblage of each site and noted the frequency with which each of the six materials was used. And then I modeled multiple ranges around the site, the size of which corresponding to the closest source point of the material from the site. And then I shaded the ranges so that here the dark and opaque areas are the areas that are more <coughs> frequently used for raw material procurement than the ones that are light and transparent. And this here is basically, this is what I call procurement ranges and is basically a visual of the mobility potential in each time frame. So in the middle Paleolithic, we can see the same regional differences. Um, the groups on the coast, they traveled only very, very small, uh, very short distances to get the raw materials, while those in the inland were traveling much farther distances. This mobility remains high in the Ibram uh, but it's not quite as high as before. So most of the mobility is restricted to a broadly triangular region in the interior of the study area, and there are very few or very rare movements towards the coast. And then in the Epipaleolithic, in the Holocene, once the group split up into three regions, their mobility decreases drastically. Um, the maximum travel distances, they're still pretty large, but the regularly used areas, they're so small that they're not even visible on the map. They're maybe 100 or maybe even 50 meters away from the site because the groups went and settled directly at their lithic sources. Okay. Yeah, after finishing the reconstruction, the last step was to check the quality of the reconstructions. And during this whole process, I was able to identify a few factors that have the potential to distort um, of the analysis of either the economic potential, the site distribution, or the mobility. So the economic potential, the analysis of it or the characterization can be distorted by knowledge gaps concerning resources or sites, as well as any kinds of research biases. And if this is distorted, then it goes, uh, keeps going further and distorts the characterization of the activities and the uh, occupation duration of a site. Research biases can also distort the site distribution along with other factors such as uneven site survival, chronological visibility, and layer mixture. And this can go further and affect the characterization of the resource distribution and also of the procurement strategy. To a certain degree, this applies to this data set. For example, um, uneven site survival means that some regions that I analyze, an analyzed are devoid of sites from specific time frames, so that the patterns that I recognized here and presented during the site distribution analysis are a little more clustered than they could have been. And finally, um, something that I didn't talk about at all, the resolution of the digital elevation model used for the site catchment analyses and um, various issues concerning the raw material descriptions can influence the reconstruction of Paleolithic groups' mobility. So um, this kind of method that I proposed here isn't restricted to spatial data. Um, it's, uh, you can incorporate site-specific and environmental data as well, as I did a little bit, but it can get even stronger. Um, and this has to be done in order to reconstruct all of the land use elements that I presented at the beginning. Which analysis is ultimately undertaken depends on the data available and the research question. And even with, but even with all different kinds of data and all different kinds of analysis methods, um, we can still ensure the comparability by knowing where the distortions are and where the data gaps are. And with this, we can judge how reliable each reconstruction is. And this is the starting point for interregional comparisons so we can undertake similar land use reconstructions for any kind of data set and compare it to others. And that was it. Thank you.